Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. All right, good day to you. God bless you. Say welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. We're ready to get back in our Father's Word, the book of Job, the persecuted. You know, the best lesson you can have if you think you're ever persecuted is to check out this book of Job and go into depth. Look at the four W's, if you would, who was persecuting him, why they were persecuting him, when did they persecute him, and so forth. And then you'll have a pretty good idea, in as much as Job was symbolic of God's election, Satan has a high disregard and dislike for God's elect. Why? They were those that battled him in the first earth age. And needless to say, you're not top on his list unless it's his get him list. So. Thank goodness that our Father gave us the power and the authority that He's got to run from us. That's why you take name and kick dragon. You don't put up with it. But Job didn't know that. So he suffers through th about 30 chapters of yakety, yakety, rack, ratchet jaw stuff, all right, of his three friends, and they have no conception whatsoever of what's going on. And so it is today when you listen to advice from men and many times preachers, some preachers can give fair advice, um, a few, and if it aligns with God's Word, fine. If it doesn't, that's just what you got, you know, words, words, words. So learn from God's Word and be able to discern uh, what it is, what your problem is, why you are being persecuted, and put a stop to it, period, just like that. All right, chapter 29, verse 1, a word of wisdom from our Father in Yeshua's name. Now, bear in mind, Job has, has uh, basically, in as much as, as uh, he was discussing um, the Zophars, was discussing true wealth, true wealth being wisdom, Job knew he still had his. He wasn't a sinner, as they were accusing him of. And so he picks it up in chapter 29, and he talks a little rough to him. He's... This will be his, uh, one of his final uh, debates with them. It'll be about three chapters long, so hang on to it. Let's go with it. Chapter 29 and 1, it reads, Moreover, Job continued his parable. He picked up from where he had left off the last time after Zophar's little get-to there, and said, Oh, that I were as the months passed and in the days when God preserved me, before all this happened. It'd really be something if I could call back that time. He had 10 children. He was rich with cattle. He was an advisor to people. Verse 3, uh, when his candle shined upon my head, when God blessed me, and when by his light I walked through darkness, there was no dark for me. He was with me. That's the way it should be for you today, so don't let that remark pass, all right? Four. As I was in the days of my youth, when the secret of God was upon my tabernacle. That is to say, when I enjoyed the friendship of Yah in my very home, uh, he was blessed. And of course, what he doesn't know, it's Satan that's oppressing him, not God. And I would warn you again, you want to be very careful if you ever say, wonder what burden God's got for me today. That's dangerous because God does not, I repeat, does not send burdens. He will alleviate burdens, your burdens you allow to happen. So don't blame anyone but yourself. Kick them off, get up, and do it again right the next time. Verse 4, I'm sorry, verse uh, 5 it is, and it reads, When the Almighty was yet with me, when my children were about me, in my youth means when he was younger, before this happened, it didn't mean when he was a child, okay? Uh, he misses his children, that's obvious. His wife, I don't know. After she told him, why don't you just dry up and die uh, somewhere? Well, maybe he didn't miss her so bad, six. 
When I, watch, when I washed my steps with butter and the rock poured me out rivers of oil. I was so blessed that even if I had an olive tree growing from just an old crevice out of the rock, it just produced and produced for me, okay? So no problem. Verse 7. When I went out to the gate through the city, when I prepared my seat in the street. In other words, this indicates that he was a chief, or at least the street and the gate is a place of judgment. So he had a great deal to do there with judgment itself. He was a leader, an elder. Verse 8. The young men saw me and hid themselves, and the aged arose and stood up. That means I was respected. When I walked in, things happened. They respected my wisdom. Verse 9. The princes refrained talking and laid their hand on their mouth. In other words, this is men of authority even held their peace when I walked into that judgment place. 10. The nobles held their peace and their tongue cleaved to the roof of their mouth. What, what I said was important. Why wouldn't it? God was so very proud of him. Do you understand from chapter 1? Satan said, hey, you just protect him. I can have him. You turn loose. God said you can do anything, but don't take his life. God was very pleased with Job. So was apparently everyone else. 11. When the ear heard me, then it blessed me. And when the eye saw me, it gave witness to me. In other words, they actually waited for my opinion on, on things of wisdom. Verse 12. Because I delivered the poor that cried, and the fatherless, and him that had none to help him, uh, he's kind of answering old Eliaphas uh, here from chapter 22, verses 6 through 9, when he accused him of, of uh, trotting down the widow and the orphan and so forth. Uh, verse 13, The blessing of him that was ready to perish came upon me, and I caused the widow's heart to sing for joy. In other words, I was able to bless those that were just at the point of ruin. And here he sits today in sackcloth and ashes, and he's not treated well at all. And he had been respected by most everyone, even royalty, basically. Verse 14, I put on righteousness, and it clothed me. I wore righteousness as a garment. My judgment was as a robe and a diadem. It was a turban of respect, so to speak. And, um, you know, your, your mind should go to a deeper level all the way to the uh, 19th chapter of the great book of Revelation, whereby it stipulates in about verses 8, 9, where at the wedding that they put on their, right, their white robes, which are woven from their righteous acts. Okay? And connecting that with his robe of righteousness, 15. I was eyes to the blind. I helped them. And feet was I to the lame. I, I helped the poor. I, I helped those that were down and out. I helped the handicapped. Job, this is why God, again, I, have, I will repeat, was so very fond of this son of his because, hey, he was good. He was a good man. These three ratchet jaws are all they can do because he has lost everything can say, what great sin did you do? Okay, He didn't sin at all. Satan's just trying to chew on him. 16. I was a father to the poor. I looked out for them. And the cause which I knew not, I searched out. Um, I... I um, Tended even as strangers would. I searched in depth and I looked for answers. I, um, I, I tended a stranger. I took care of everyone that I could. 17. And I break the jaws or the fangs of the wicked and pluck the spoil out of his teeth. In other words, um, verse 18, and then we'll, we'll backtrack here. 18. Then I said... I shall die in my nest, and I shall multiply my days as the sand. In other words, my sand, or my life rather, the days are going to be uncountable like the sands of the sea. 
But what it's saying here is when someone was oppressed, if there was a bully come along, he knocked his teeth out. Okay, you got that? You know, a good righteous people sometimes are misunderstood by the faint of heart because sometimes when you live in the real world to really protect the poor and the down and out, sometimes a few things have to be dislodged, all right? Verse 19, I mean, just a good Christian thought, winning friends here, influencing people, but that's very biblical. That you can, that you can count on. Verse 19 reads, My root was spread out by the waters, and the dew lay all night upon my branch. In other words, the healthy tree, the successful tree, its roots are by the water, you know, and this is, this is an analogy concerning success. And that God would allow the very dew itself to water, which dew, until we got so much pollution, was the purest waters there were of night. 20. My glory was fresh in me, and my bow was renewed in my hand. In other words, I, my bowstring was always tight. It all, there were plenty of arrows every time I needed one in my hand. In, the, in other words, this is a description of everything was rosy. I mean, I had it really nice. Why? Because he had God's blessings. Do you? You know, God often allows, I suppose, to our testing. He wants us to be a good warrior because the controversy that's going on between Satan and God with Job and his three friends has, has actually progressed from the very beginning. It started in the garden. And it continues even to this day. God blesses after you earn it. All right, 21. Unto me men gave ear and waited and kept silent at my counsel. They listened. Words of wisdom. Why? All wisdom comes from God. And Job was a friend of God. God himself so stated. 22. After my words, they spake not again, and my speech dropped upon them. In other words, they did not question my wisdom, my answer. Again, bear in mind, Job is not blowing his own horn here. Um, the, um, uh, the last debater had really told Job, instructed him what true wisdom was. Job's answering at his wisdom, 20, 23. And they waited for me as for the rain, and they opened their mouth wide. They drank in what I said wide as for the latter rain. They uh, took it in. They thirsted for that wisdom. And again, Job was a bountifully blessed from our Father, none other. 24. If I laughed on them, they believed it not, and the light of my countenance they cast not down. A smile from me lifted them up. And what are you saying? If um, the Hebrew is not carried through real well, what it means in the first part of this particular verse is, um, if someone were to have told them I would mock them, they wouldn't believe it. They knew I wouldn't do that. Why is Job saying that? Because he's being mocked every day. He's being spat upon, mocked, ridiculed, he said, even when I was in this position, if someone would have said I would have mocked someone in trouble, they wouldn't have believed it. Why? He wouldn't do it. Verse 25. I choose out their way. I chose out their way and um, set chief and dwelt as a king in the army, as one that comforteth the mourners. This is what I was. I wasn't a sinner. That's what he was saying. He cannot, over and over and over, he's tried to get it across to these three knuckleheads, you know, and, and you've heard preachers preach sermons from what those knuckleheads said, and probably it's in the Bible, there it is. Yeah, a bunch of nut cakes, you know, uh, being against Job. So can you discern the difference? I don't know that uh, God knows, doesn't he? And those that listen to you know, don't they? Chapter 30, verse 1. But now they that are younger than I have me in derision, whose fathers 
I would have disdained to have sat with the dogs of my flock. In other words, the younger come in here, they mock, they spit, and their fathers are, I would, I would hold my sheep dogs in higher esteem than I would their fathers. In other words, they're, what he's saying here, just to put it in good old plain English, their father's not as good as, a, as, as like a cur dog, not a sheep dog, a cur dog, which uh, is a pretty low dog in the Hebrew tongue, Tw two. Yea, where too might the strength of their hands profit me, in whom old age was uh, perished? I mean, I'm, it would seem that, that um, uh, what good strong arms, but yet at the same time it seems like the strength is all faded away. It just the vigor is wasted. Verse 3, for want and famine they were solitary and fleeing into the wilderness in former times, desolate and waste. They had to feed their fathers, who know better than curs, where these mockers come from. Uh, we drove them out from um, <clears throat> among us like a bunch of thieves, where they had to eat out in the wilderness. They couldn't be around men. He said, I got to put up with this stuff now. Verse 4, who cut up uh, mallows, by the bushes and juniper roots for their meat. The Hebrew word here is, is um, it's um, probably if I were to call it a salt wart, meaning that it grows up from the very salt itself and you rub it, you know. Um, they had to eat and off of the juniper roots, five, that's pretty, pretty slim pickings, friend. The salt wart, of course, or mallows, is, uh, that, that means herbs. They had to Eat worse than the cur dog, even, if you would. Okay, five. They were driven forth from among men. They cried after them as after a thief. That, why? Because of the crimes they committed. They were no better than a cur dog. And, and again, this is what Satan will do to you, friend. If you, if you hold still and let Satan take you down and down and down, uh, many times Satan uses a real special thing in this generation to do that with drugs, you know. And, and somebody that's hooked, you can't tell them anything. And I guarantee you, they will lose everything they have, everything, family, friends, the whole schmutz. It's, it's just a tool of the devil and people... Like to, I guess they like to hear Satan laugh at them or something. I don't know. Down they go. Six. To dwell in the cliffs of the valleys, in caves of the earth, and in the rocks. In the gullies and the ravines like a bunch of gully rats. All right. Now, I add the word rats, but kind of that's what's implied. They, can, they can't live civil. Seven. Among the bushes they braid. Under the nettles... They were gathered together. These nettles uh, are probably um, offshoot of the wild mustard plant. And, and they, it was quite bushy and it would grow up high enough that it would hide a rider on a horse even. And they would huddle together in groups and, and be ready to attack anyone that might be coming through. Like low criminals, they huddled in these places and um, lived off the, best, the land the best they could. Eight. They were children of fools, yea, children of base men. They were viler than the earth. And that's, um, they, they were expelled from the land, the livable, the civilized land. Why? They weren't fit to live among civilized people. You ever met anybody like that? Now, you might ask yourself, well, now, is Job saying that his three friends are like this? Well, that's up for, to you to draw the conclusion. He has done his best with them. They took a lot of help from him while he was wealthy. That's why they rushed to his aid. You know, let's help him out. He's been a big boost to us. It didn't seem like they want to boost him, though. And not only is he getting it from them, but he's getting it from the low life of the land now that he has been dispelled from rulership or anything to do with keeping peace and order and righteous reigning. 
You see what it's come to. A pitiful, pitiful sight when people that are not on the same level as a cur dog can mock you where you're so defenseless that you can't uh, remove a few fangs from a cur dog, kick them out, then, and then turn the other cheek if you're teaching him. But if he's coming up attacking you, you don't worry about turning the other cheek. You weren't worry about getting the other fang, all right? A uh, word to the wise is sufficient. Verse 9, And now am I their song, yea, I am their byword. In other words, I'm their target. And all their jokes are, my name is nothing but a joke among that bunch of cur dogs. Ten. They abhor me. They flee far from me and spare not to spit in my face. Um, they flee from, they did before they would flee from me. They'd run like scared rabbits and now they spit in my face. Poor Job. Friend, don't ever let yourself get in this shape. Why? Uh, Christ had not died on the cross at this time. Now he did pay that price on the cross. And one of the last things he, one of the very best things, one of the best that he accomplished for us in Luke chapter 10, along about verse 19, is he gave us power over all of our enemies. So use it, claim it, use it. Verse 11, because he hath loosed my cord, and afflicted me, they have also let loose the bridle before me. They, if they come at me, this, uh, the Hebraism is that they come at me like a mob, and the he, he's kind of like saying, God loosed my bowstring, which means what? He's unarmed. I, I don't have my armament anymore. I'm not blessed like I was back in that verse where my bowstring was always tight, and every time I wanted an arrow, there was one in my hand. Now he's unarmed and they come at him like a mob. And this was the gathering of the fools back in the bushes. They're the uh, wild mustard plants, I'll call them, okay? Verse 12. Upon my right hand rise the youth. They push away my feet and they uh, raise up against me the ways of their destruction. They, they hit me in the right flank. They knocked my feet out from under me. They, they treated the poor old Job something miserable. And poor old Job is a sore ball from the top of his head to his, the bottom of his feet. He's lack, he lacks strength, and they're mistreating him something awful. I, I might add another insult to his three friends. Why did they put up with this? If they were su such ratchet jaw, you know, they were able to talk so much, why couldn't they kick out a few fangs when people would insult? You know, a real friend is not going to let somebody mock one of his buddies that's down and out. He's going to start taking names and kicking dragon right on the spot. Now, these three friends were sure washouts, all right? Again, I would say, if you've got friends like that, you don't need enemies. Verse 13. They mar my path. They set forward my calamity. They have no helper. They tear down my defense and they come on unhindered, just wave after wave, it would seem. Seem like as if, if about the time I get one thing under control, here they bring something else. 14. They come upon me as a wide breaking of the in of waters. Like um a huge swell attacking a beach. The enemy comes in like that. In the desolation, they rolled themselves upon me, just covered him over. 15. Terrors, terrors are turned upon me. They pursue my soul as the wind. Think deep now. And my welfare passeth away as the cloud. My, you, you've seen an old early morning cloud and dry season when you're needing rain, it just vanishes away. He says, my hope is kind of just vanishing away. I don't, I don't know, but there's one thing. His faith stood firm, all right? Verse 16, and now my soul is poured out upon me. The days of affliction have taken hold upon me. They've taken their toll. 
Uh, I, I'm in the grip of uh, misery daily. I mean, the pain won't quit, all right? It's pretty sad. We're probably seeing Job at one of his lowest ebbs here in this particular chapter as we have digressed to this point. 17. My bones are pierced in me in the night season, and my sinew take no rest. There's a throbbing pain in the very veins of my flesh, and my bones just have aching pains all night long, right to the very moral of the bone, if you would. Um, they throb away in pain. 18. But the great force of my disease is my garment changed. It bindeth me about as the collar of my coat. Uh, what he's saying here, you know, you've seen somebody's old coat collar when it just gets twisted and rumpled. It's like my whole body seems to be just out of place. It's crooked and it's twisted. Pretty sad shape, all right? Verse 19. He hath cast me into the mire, and I am become like dust and ashes. Now, he's kind of indicating here that God has done this to him, poor old Job. He knows that God has allowed it. But what he's really, where he's really missing the mark is Satan's the one that's doing it. And Satan, as God's elect, will do it to you if you let him. So... One of the things I want to really bear down on the misery this one is in at this time is that it's all the more reason why you should take no misery from him at all. You don't have to. If you ever think you have to, then read Luke chapter 10, verse, start about verse 18. It'll do you good to read that. And then really pick the truth up in the 19th verse. Behold, I, be, I beheld Satan fall as a star upon the earth coming down here to mess up the election if they'll let him. We won't let him. Learn the lesson well. You don't have to put up with it. There's power in the name. And whatever you do, don't blame God for your troubles. You made the choice. You made the decision. And no doubt you allowed someone to mislead you. Well, don't blame God. That's your fault. If you're too stupid to not know a real, a real good advisor from one that isn't, you still made the final decision to go along with it. So don't blame anyone else. Blame yourself. And just because, you know, we all make bad choices at times, but don't let that get you down. Get up and get going. You can always go the next hill. Verse 20, I cry unto thee and thou dost not hear me. I stand up and thou regardest me not. I'm trying to get your attention, Father. Me here. You see, our father had already told Satan, you can do anything but kill him. And I'll let you. Well, God's got to sit back and take all this in. You know, he has a lot of faith in you if you're one of his elect. It does him really good to know he can count on you. Even if Satan bruises you a little bit and you keep going, it just it makes God's day. That's why you, you want to you learn to win, all right? How do I learn how to win? God's Word. Make a champion out of you, all right? It sure beats getting kicked down like poor old Job is here now. Stand up and be counted, 21. Thou art become cruel to me. With thy strong hand thou opposest thyself against me. It just seems to me like that Father, that you are, that you have joined the other side. Now that's kind of, that's kind of bad that he opposes him. Now, now I want you to stop a moment, and I want you to just kind of kick things out of gear here a moment and pause. Let's think about this. Here is Job trying to answer these three ratchet jaws. Satan is pulling the strings. All right, he's managing this whole affair. And Job says, I think even Father is against me. I think even he is opposing me in this. How do you think that made Satan feel? I bet Satan laughed right in God's face at that moment. I told you, told you, y'all. 
I told you I could get him. See there, he's blaming you now instead of me. Don't ever be that way, all right? Don't ever, ever accuse your father of what Satan does to you or what you in being misinformed allow to happen to yourself. Don't do it. That makes Satan's day and it hurts your father. And the only way you're going to be blessed is for you to make the father's, your father's day. Make him proud of you. Take names and kick a little dragon. All right? You have the power and the ability to do that. So I can see Satan after this statement by Job in 21 is just laughing his head off. It wasn't a good moment for our father. Be careful. That's all I'm saying. Verse 22. Thou liftest me up to the wind. Thou causest me to ride upon it and dissolveth my substance. This really loses it in the translation. At one time you lifted me up where I could even ride the wind like a spirit. And now you tumble me wrong and, dis and dissolveth me like chaff in front of that wind. Like something that's fit for nothing. 23. For I know that thou wilt bring me to death. Everybody's got to die. That's true. And to the house appointed for all living. The house appointed means the mortal man. You, so many people, and as, bad, you know, as hard as I try to teach, that you must know you have two bodies, different the flesh and your spirit body. And when we're through with the flesh body, we're through with it. It's so hard for some people that have listened to the ratchet jaws too long to realize that the flesh body, this mortal, and you know the Hebrew is very, a very good language. It separates the two. But not in English. Their little minds just have to... It's just me. It's me, oh God. Well, you, there's two of you. So learn to, to separate the difference. The flesh is going into the grave and stay there, and your spiritual body is going to go back to the Father that gave it, all right? And he's talking here about the flesh. It's going in a hole in the ground, and it's going to go back to dust, period. But who would want it anyway? I mean, as great as the flesh body is for what it can attain when we're through with it, you have something, you have your reward, all right? Anyway, that's what he's talking about here. Verse 24, how be it he will not stretch out his hand to the grave, though they cry in his destruction. Um, what he's kind of saying here is the thought that even, even, even if a beggar reaches out and asks for help, somebody maybe will help him. He stretches out his hand, and here he's calling out to God, and God's trying to be proud of his boy here, and we're, we're, you know, we're in the last quarter, and Job has done real good up to this time, but if he isn't careful, he's going to lose the ball game here pretty quick. He's not going to, I'll assure you that, but I, I just want you to see the emotions of our father as he's watching this game, and it means a lot to him that his son will overcome Satan. That a mere mortal man, uh, with everything stripped, could stand against Satan by himself, simply with the faith that he has in God, knowing that whether he lives or dies, that he has the victory in our Father. That, that's saying a lot, my friend. That's saying an awful lot. How, how about you? How do you feel about that? How much faith do you have in your father? Father certainly doesn't like people that uh, are of little faith. Let's go one more verse, 25. Did not I weep for him that was in trouble? Was not my soul grieved for the poor? I, I helped them. When someone reached out to me, I grabbed that hand. I raised them up. I helped them, helped them get well and pacified them and look. Just don't give up, my friend. Let's just finish this chapter. We got time. Let's do it. 26. When I looked for good, then evil came into me. And when I waited for light, there came darkness. It seems like to me, um, there's no way out of this for me. When I ask for help, my friends, all I can get out of them is ratchet, ratchet, ratchet jaw. 27. My bowels boiled and rested not. The 
days of affliction prevented me. My stomach was so upset, my nervous system and so forth. 28, I went mourning without the sun. I, um, I stood up and I cried in the congregation. But there was no one to comfort me. Don't you ever forget you're never alone and Christ is always there with you. I don't care if every soul in a church turns into a ratchet jaw and turns on you. You've got the Lord, all right, if you're right. If you're being righteous and trying to ask and seek help. 29, I am a brother to dragons, or better translated, jekylls, and a companion to owls, it would seem. 30, my skin is black upon me and my bones are burned with heat. My skin peels off and my body is just scorched with the, from the heat that I'm in here. And you could imagine those old sore boils and his skin's dead. 31, my harp also is turned to mourning and my organ into the voice of them that weep. It seems like there is no happy song about me and everything seems to just be a thing of uh, lamentation. I will use that word instead of mourning. This is his sad song. And it is sad. I'm going to tell you what. God had a lot of faith in Job. And Job had a lot of faith in God. Did he weaken? Well, it would be easy to say, well, wasn't he kind of weak there? He never lost his faith. He had even stated once before to one of the ratchet jaws, even if I die, if God kills me, I still have my faith to know I have eternal life. That's faith. So, um, how, how, do, how can I say it? Even at his lowest, he knew that God had a positive plan for him, that it was going to work out fine. He wasn't about to give in to unrighteousness. You really got to hand it to Job. Father could be proud of him. It would really be something if he could be that proud of you or myself. I, you know, we just try and try and seem like, Sometimes we mess up more often than we should. Give Satan his little laugh, but then start kicking dragon again, okay? Make your father proud, and he'll see that you're blessed. We have the tools, as you learn from his word, and as much as all wisdom comes from our father, how to be successful in taking names and kicking dragon, all right? That makes Father's Day, and I know there are some Christians that could never under comprehend that. They're just too much powder puff, unrealistic, can't face reality powder puffs, you know, to really understand our Father in this earth age. But be that as it may, I guess there should be always that 10% that's fluff balls, you know. So, and... And I'm not talking against them. They're just, just sweet people and just not worth a darn for anything. Kind of sickening sweet sometimes. But when you really get in trouble and need help, whatever you do, don't call for one of them. Okay? This old combat Marine knows what he's talking about, friend, in more ways than one. I've seen life put right to the acid test of life and death. I, I know what kind of people you can count on. They are valuable to you as friends. Pick your friends well. All right, bless your heart. You listen a moment, won't you please? The Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It is getting light in the game. You need to know what the Mark of the Beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, many will be deceived. There is no need for you to be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject, the mark of the beast. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. We don't even ask for the shipping and handling. It is free as well. All you need to do is call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of The Mark of the Beast. You may also request your free CD by mailing your request to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. All right, there we are back again, the 800 number, 1-800-643-4645. That number is good from Puerto Rico, throughout the U.S., Alaska, Hawaii, all over Canada. If the spirit moves and you have a question, 
you share it. Once you do that, please never ask a question about a particular denomination, individual, or organization. You know, especially if they're a fluff ball, all right? Let's don't, let's don't uh, mention their names to offend them. Let's teach God's Word verse by verse and convert them. Say, that's real love is when somebody needs a little straightening out, give it to them. I know God straightens us out when we need it, does he not? So that's the way it gets done. You, you can count on that. Those of you that listen by short wave around the world at this time, it's always a pleasure hearing from you, and um, it's good to have you with us. Your announcer at the end of the hour will give you our mailing address. You got a prayer request? He's your father. His emotions run strong toward his children that try, that want to study. Prayer is simply talking to him. Don't, don't get some prayer book and start reading prayers. You're wasting your time. Give it to him from the heart. Tell him you love him and you need him. And it, it mellows the very uh, being of God that a child would give him that respect. And the blessings begin to flow. Father, around the globe we come. We ask that you lead, guide, direct, Father. Touch in Yeshua's precious name. Heal, Father. Amen, amen. All right. Let's get into some questions. We got Luke from New York. I don't think that's New York City, but New York. And we got a lot of good people in New York. And I don't know about that New York City, though. Okay, Luke from New York. Wasn't it God's intention for all people to live on earth and that was the purpose of creating the earth? Yep. Uh, does this mean Satan won, meaning none will live on earth after Armageddon? Where in the world did you get that? You know what, Luke? You didn't finish reading the book, did you? You see, the 21st chapter stipulates that even God himself is coming to this earth to set his kingdom up on this earth. This was Jesus' prayer in Matthew, Our Father, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, and heaven is wherever God is, yeah. So where did you get the idea that it was going to be anywhere else but earth? Just because somebody uses the word heaven? Going bound to heaven, heaven. Heaven is wherever God is, all right? And uh, he's coming here, so we've got heaven and earth, both all here. Read the 21st chapter. Finish the book of Revelation and be educated in the Word of God, all right? And you'll be glad you did. Naturally, you know, probably one of the first things Luke's going to do, and he's a pretty good student, but it's going to say there's a new earth. It means a new earth age. It's called the eternity, all right? Same old earth, Eretz, terra firma, cosmos in the Greek. I'm just calling off a few different languages here, biblical languages of uh, the soil. You know, it's good, really good. It's where we're going to be. It's home. Uh, Anthony from Georgia, I have heard you speak about prosperity and then say it is a subject that you don't want to speak about in depth. Is this because you do not believe in teaching a prosperity message? Anthony, uh, you didn't quite hear what you say you heard here. I said, I don't teach all that much on tithing because tithing is a personal thing. And I'm not, if, if I teach... If I were to go to great ends of teaching about tithing, people would think I was begging, and, and God didn't send a beggar forth here in this old boy. I don't beg. I don't have to. I teach well enough and strong enough God's Word until there are intelligent people that support this ministry quite well without me begging. So uh, God, Christ said, whatever you do, if you're going to teach God's Word, don't take a begging bag with you. I believe that. But the prosperity message is a sick message, the way many people teach it. And if you just want me to tell you the truth about it, it's if you believe it's going to be there. That ain't true. I'll tell you what. 
if uh, let's say that you decide, uh, Anthony, you need to go to work and earn, you know, you're going to feed your family, but why don't you run down to the grocery store and tell the store manager that you're a Christian, a servant of God, and you're a prosperity believer, and you'll be there at the end of each week believing that he'll have your bill of groceries handed to you because you're a prosperity person. Hmm? I wonder how many times he will fill your hand with groceries. That doesn't make sense and it doesn't work that way. Faith in God and when you bless God, he will bless you not until. You're not supposed to worry. And not, This is just kind of my answer to prosperity teaching. You might have heard me say I would never preach prosperity, the so-called prosperity message. This is the reason why. God does not like people who are worry warts because they worry all the time. And he said it won't add one second to your whole life if you worry all your life. If anything, it'll make it shorter. Why do you want to worry when there's not one sparrow falls without me knowing about it? And look at the lilies. Solomon himself couldn't have dressed himself better than I dressed the hillsides. And then he goes on to say and complete the work and thought, I know what your needs are, and after you serve me, I say, after you serve me, I will add these things onto you. Does you know what that means? That means after you do the work, I will prosper you. But until then, you can believe all you want to believe that God is going to milk your cows for you, that God is going to feed your horses for you, that God is going to mow your lawn for you, and you're going to have the readiest lawn in the neighborhood, and you're not going to feed your family too well. You have to work for it, and God then blesses you. Now, I know that I probably offend some, but I, I'm a realist. You know, I've been knocking around this old world quite a bit, and I know the difference in being hungry and being full, all right? I, I kind of know the way God works, and I'm going to teach it that way, and I'm sure not going to mislead it. You know, many people of the prosperity teachers will go one step further and say, if you want to believe God for $5,000, then you need, to, you need to send me 10% of it right now. Let's see, how much would that be? 10% of 5,000 would be 500, is that right? I hope that's right, I think it is. If you don't have 500, go down and borrow it and send it to me. And then believe you're gonna get your five. Now that's a, anybody that would fall for that is about the dumbest person I've ever seen in my life. God doesn't want it until after you make it. So anyway, that's just my little thoughts about prosperity, all right? I'm pretty prosperous myself, but I've always worked for it. My ministry is very prosperous because God, all I teach is God's Word, and it is very good to be blessed from God and by people that are intelligent, all right? Lori from California. At the great judgment, does the Bible say whether or not everything I have ever done will be shown for everyone else to see. Please document. Well, Lori, what kind of church have you been going to? Everything you've ever done brought out before everybody in the world, and shame on you, you should have been in that church every time that door opened. What does God's word say about repentance? He said, repent, and it's erased, clean uh, uh, slate. And he said, I don't ever want to hear about it again. Now, how in the world, if you repent of all your sins and they're erased, do you think that some preacher, some preacher's got to have told you this? If God says, I don't ever want to hear about it again, that means now and forevermore. Why in the world would you let some preacher lead you into believing he's going to bring it up on Judgment Day? You see, somebody lied to you, dear. Ratchet jaws will do it to you. When you repent, it's done. That's the beauty of Christianity. And anytime you go to a church that puts you in bondage being a Christian, they're, they're not doing you right. Let me tell you something. It's not really a Christian church because Christ will set you free. Free indeed. 
documentation. St. John chapter 8, verse 32, somewhere along in there. Learn the truth and the truth will set you free. It won't put you in bondage like, oh, good heavenly days. Although, I, I, you know something? I would be frightened right now and almost I'd blush if I thought everything I'd ever done wrong was going to be shown to everybody on Judgment Day. But praise God, I've repented and it's gone. It's just like I was a good boy all the time. Like it never happened. And it's gone forever. Don't let them put you on a guilt trip. Randy from Georgia. Now don't anyone write and ask me what it was that I did that would make me embarrassed because you ain't going to learn, I'll tell you for sure. Randy from Georgia. What is meant by the last shall be first and the first shall be last? Thanks. I thank God for your gift of teaching. Well, God bless you and we will keep up the good work. Randy, the first earth age, those that stayed true to the very last and were the first, follow me now, were the first to be chosen. Jeremiah, God says, verse chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, I chose you before you ever was in this earth age in your mother's womb to be a prophet. Why? He overcame there. Uh, Romans chapter 8, uh, starting with verse 26, I foreordained you. You don't even know what to pray for, but I foreordained you. Why? Because you were along with the first fruits of the first fruits, and I justified you, which is to say judged you there. And they are last in this generation. There has been a remnant always, but the election was last in this generation. Why? We know how to do battle with Satan, and we're going to win. That's why we're, we were first to be chosen in the first earth age and we're the last generation in this earth age and we're going to win. Okay, uh, Johnetta from, Johnette rather, from, from uh, Wisconsin. If an occasion should ever arise in which my family and I are confronted by someone with a gun that is threatened to possibly shoot at us, in God's eyes, can we also arm and protect ourselves and even possibly shoot another person in self-defense? Well, Janetta, number one, if you're, not, if you're not trained to handle guns, I wouldn't advise it until you take a course. The, uh, I highly recommend the National Rifle Association, the NRA. They teach people how to safely, I repeat, safely. You hear people having accidents, the way you get away from accidents is to be like old Marines, know how to handle a piece, that's to say a weapon. You know, in the Marine Corps, we had to be able to tear them down, put them back together in the dark, and certainly know whether they were loaded or unloaded. There was a time for, the, but what I'm saying is, obey the laws of the land. There are certain cities that will not allow weapons. Well, uh, you won't ever have to worry about catching me in one of those places, because I'm not going to be there. A, a city that will violate the Constitution of the United States of America is not part of an America, and I don't want to live there. Because one of the first rules of our Constitution is it guarantees our right to bear arms for our own protection. So uh, you get one of these towns, uh, I think there was one poor old mayor that's been so brainwashed and confused that he's on a jag of trying to rip off the innocent citizens of his cities for their own protection. But be that as it may, you, sometimes you think a man's a good man and he ends up being nothing but a powder puff. Anyway, learn how to shoot. Learn how to shoot what, you, to hit what you're shooting at. Follow civil laws and don't ever let anybody harm your family. You know, we rural people really have difficulty understanding how some people are in the city because here, you know, as a child, we got much of our food on the table by hunting. And we were taught, usually no later than the age of 12, you, were, you could go out on your own and hunt and bring back meat for the table. Um, and uh, we later on, you... you uh, it even gets to the point where if you're killing game, if you hit it anywhere besides in the head, you're not very much of a hunter because that kind of spoils the meat, unless you're using a shotgun. But anyway, um, to, to, but 
if we had, if, if somebody was breaking into our house and we had to wait for the law to get there to save us, oh dear God, save us, we'd all be dead, I guarantee you, because when you live out in the country, the law, I don't care how fast they are, they're not that fast. Sometimes it takes 12 hours, you know, be that, and it could only be 10 miles away and it'll still take 12 hours. But we got some good policemen too. I stand behind our police forces. But at the same time, we have the right to protect our home. Hey, if somebody breaks into one of our houses meaning to do harm and it's obvious he's going to, he's paid for. Have a good trip. I mean, it's very legal, but always do what's legal, all right, in your community. If you don't like your community, move out, all right? Now that's, uh, that's the way I feel about it. Hey, you have to do what you want, but always protect your family. The, the person who is the kinsman redeemer, that's to say that is the head of the house, usually the woman. I mean, I, I jest, all right? I jest. But you should have someone that has a skill of being able to protect the family. Now, there's one sheriff down in Texas, a lady that she can, I'll tell you one thing, she can use a handgun, and I'm out of time. Here I got sidetracked, didn't I? You get old Marines talking about firearms in our Constitution, and it was such a pleasure protecting it, and at the same time, in honor, I should say, though it's a terrible thing. But the good it does of keeping freedom in this nation was well worth the price because this is a great place. Protect your family. I'm out of time. I love you all because you enjoy studying our Father's Word in more depth. What's most important, God loves you for it. You understand? That brings His blessings on you. And that's why He sent this letter to you called the Bible, telling you how to be happy. We're brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we've helped you, you help us keep coming to you. But most important, this. You stay in His Word. Every day in His Word is a good day, even with trouble. You know why? Jesus, Yeshua, is the living Word. Hearing God's Word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you.